It's a pleasure to bring your message this morning in remembrance of the 500-year anniversary of the Reformation. We are looking at the five solas. The 500-year anniversary of the Protestant Reformation has been led by brave Christian men such as Martin Luther, Ulrich Zwingli, John Calvin, and William Tyndale, all who have had a heavy hand into uh, the contribution into this Reformation time and period that started even way back with John Wycliffe. That's a name that some of us may not hear too often, where he actually translated the Bible as well and was excommunicated himself. In celebration to the impact that the Reformation had on Christianity and to the trajectory of the church history, for the month of October, we will be preaching the biblical doctrines behind the five solas. So we started with Pastor Rick Wilson, where he had uh, introduced the context behind the solas. And last week, we heard Pastor Greg Kurtz preach on sola scriptura, the authority of scripture alone. And also be looking at sola gratia, salvation by God's grace alone. Sola fide, through our faith alone. Solus Christus in Christ alone, soli de gloria, all to the glory of God alone. The five solos are pillar statements, five pillar statements that collectively represent a line that we have drawn in the sand by which we unapologetically and dogmatically, I know we don't like the word dogmatic anymore because it represents a word that says we're unwilling to budge on this principle. The five solos are five pillar statements that collectively represent a line drawn in the sand by which we unapologetically and dogmatically say that these are the boundaries of biblical soteriology. Soteriology, the study of salvation, we look at these five solas in view of this lens. These are the undebatable tenets of the Christian faith. Throughout church history, whenever we have stepped over these five boundaries, we see the church finding itself headed at breakneck speed towards the crashing waves of apostasy. Shipwrecked men piloting the helms of shipwrecked churches. It's no wonder that from generation to generation, they have been the very object of Satan's attack on the church. Sola Scriptura, Greg preached on the non-negotiable principle that Scripture is the final authority by which we live our faith. It serves as both the foundation and the mortar that holds the other five souls in place. This is why when attack on the other souls fail to give way, then the church will usually find itself going back to defending the authority and inerrancy of Scripture and Scripture alone. Even as early as the garden, we hear Satan coming to Eve, and asking the question, did God really say? Nevertheless, we are and will continue to be people who read, study, memorize, teach, and preach the word of God. Sola gratia. We will see this morning that God's plan of salvation begins and ends with God, the gospel of God. Sola gratia begins with God, completely isolated from any human efforts and human merit. I, if you paid attention really closely as we were meditating, singing the last song, it really spoke well to this, not of our merits or any works, but by the Holy Ghost. Sola fide, faith is the means, the instrument by which God has appropriated our salvation. The Bible says that we and here's a, a, a distinction, though. When we look at sola fide and sola gratia, the difference is that God has not saved, the Bible has not said that we are saved by faith. It says we are saved by grace through faith. That is a distinction. The absence of man's work is, on the, is one primary distinguisher that sets Christianity apart from the cults that we see today. The Bible says that Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him as righteousness, sola fide, solus Christus. The apostle Peter makes a monumental statement in Acts 4 that preached to the exclusivity of Jesus Christ. He says, there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. 
The Gospel of John responds, when, when Jesus responds to Thomas in the Gospel of John, when Thomas has asked him, Lord, where are you going? He responds back to Thomas and says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. And then we have soli de gloria. It is all to the glory of God alone. The story of redemption, where God is the author, God is the hero, and God is the prize, therefore God alone gets the glory. Which brings us back to today's sola, sola gratia, Latin for salvation by God's grace alone. So what I'd like to do is that we're going to look at some of the historical challenges uh, that we have seen as this doctrine has started even as early from Augustine and Pelagius. We'll take a brief look at that and see how that has crept through even during the Reformation of the Catholic Church and how it was apostatizing as they were abusing the sola. So we'll take a look at that just briefly, and then we'll have a short, uh, short exposition of Ephesians 2, verses 1 through 8. That's the text that we'll be using this morning to help bring out the light of this sola, sola gratia. In Ephesians 2, 1 through 8, verses 1 through 3 draw attention to the, the condition of man's desperate state in order that we may highlight the beauty of sola gratia by God's grace alone that's seen in verses 4 through 8. And we do this to answer a question. What makes a sinner come to saving faith? It's the same answer that caused the Philippian jailer on the verge of committing suicide to stop in the middle of thrusting his sword through his own belly and fall down before Paul and Silas and say, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? The answer is nothing but the grace of God. Join me in prayer. Dear Father, we commit this hour to you, recognizing full well that even in the state of our foolish depravity, you reached down and gave us a transformed heart. And so, Lord, I pray that your word would go forth. May it not fall on deaf ears, but rather on fertile ground. And we pray that all this would be for the glory of of Jesus Christ, who is the means by which you had given us this grace. We thank you, and we glorify you in his name alone. Amen. In the late 4th century, there was a debate between Augustine and a man named Pelagius as to whether salvation and eternal life was obtained solely by God's grace or if man merited his salvation by good works. Pelagianism stressed complete hum human autonomy and freedom of the will before God, even in salvation. This humanistic moralism became a threat to the church, and so we look at Augustine came to the bat. Grace under Pelagianism, one would have to strongly exert his will and efforts to accept and then perform all the commands revealed in Scripture, and to that, Prayer, add to that prayer, fasting, and living the life of an ascetic, and one could by brute force attain salvation. Salvation is entirely within one's own grasp with no need of God's grace or help. As a result of this debate, Augustine successfully defended by the scriptures by pointing to the impact of original sin. Therefore, salvation is by grace alone. Subsequently, Pelagius and his teachings and his followers and his pupils were declared heresy. Nevertheless, over the course of centuries, as the Roman Catholic Church began to assume unchallenged power, even over the government, it began to slowly include traditions and the exercise of good deeds as means of securing salvation. In the 1300s, Pope Boniface VIII said, We declare, state, 
define and pronounce that for every human creature to be subject to the Roman Pope is altogether necessary for salvation. This statement, along with the innate desire to protect church assets, to protect the Roman Catholic money, to protect national power and great wealth, drove the Roman Catholic Church to adopt corrupt decrees and statutes and the selling of indulgences that would burden the common man into earning salvation. With guilt and this doctrine would challenge the doctrine of slola gratia, salvation by God's grace alone. Nevertheless, the reformers preached and teach and taught that man is completely incapable of saving himself. And apart from God's grace, man in his sinful state will not desire, believe, or even understand the things of God. That's the condition of man. If we miss this salvation by grace, what's the threat? What happens? If we miss this, then we can easily fall into moralism and legalism, works-based righteousness, pride, which leads to boasting, and boasting leads to self-righteousness, and self-righteousness leads to destruction. Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount, told the people and says, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And we look at this slippery slope, and at the top of it, we see our works-based system. And this is why sola gratia is so imperative and so important, because it says that man is incapable by himself to have any merit to earn his own salvation. And so what I want to do is as we look at Ephesians chapter 2, I kind of want to give a little bit of the context behind it, and then we'll dive into the actual scriptures. So go ahead and turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. The context of Ephesians 2, Paul is writing to the churches of Asia Minor, specifically Ephesus, where he both planted and ministered to this body of believers. He spent a lot of history there, a lot of time there. He planted it with Aquila and Priscilla, and they made a lot of noise there in Ephesus. And so he's real familiar with the church and the churches in the surrounding region of Asia Minor off the coast, and where, they, where Paul would actually look and talk to the, the Ephesians, the elders, as we see in Acts, and warn them about different heresies and false teachers. And from Roman imprisonment, he's going to write this very unique letter. And, those, and I'll just give a, just a quick snapshot. When we look at the book of Ephesians, we find that it's divided into two halves, the front half being uh, a series of indicatives or doctrines, and the second half being a series of imperatives or commands by which we are to show our faith in Christianity. And so we look at this, this letter. In the front half, he provides incredible insights regarding God's plan of salvation, mainly salvation by the grace of God. Go ahead and look at ver in chapter 1, verses 3 through 4. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. Going in verse five, 5 and 6, he says, He predestined us to the adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. Why? According to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us, in the beloved. The rest of chapter 1 and following into chapter 2, Paul writes what I call a grace sandwich. We're going to find out what it looks like when Paul, he's going to use the, his, at the end of chapter 1, he's going to talk about the inheritance that the saints have in Christ Jesus. He says, I hope that your eyes would be open. And he's going to speak about the inheritance of the saints, but then he's going to flow into chapter 2 and open up with but you were dead in the trespasses and your sins. So he goes from, look at your inheritance, to look at where you were. And then he goes into, 
and follows on by saying, For by grace you have been saved, but God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love. So that's what I call grace sandwich. That's the way he flows his writing. And beginning with the rich inheritance of the saints, he talks about what we have in Jesus Christ. In chapter 1, go ahead and briefly look at verse 18. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. And then he's going to give a description of Jesus' rule and authority by which we are and have been made joint heirs with Christ. Verse 22, he says, And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. In chapter 2, Paul switches gears to remind his readers that their former manner of life, of desperate, fallen state, almost as if to say, look how much we don't deserve. Verses 1 and 2, he says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that, ne- that is now working in the sons of disobedience. And then Paul will make a pivot. Those of you who had played sports or basketball or any particular sports, you guys know what a pivot is. It's when someone runs hard in one direction, they say you stick your foot in the ground and you turn the opposite way or turn in a different way. In football, they call it a juke. But Paul makes a pivot in Ephesians chapter 2 because he shows that, yes, this is the desperate state that man is in, but God. We're going to look at that. We're going to look at that. And then he's going to culminate in an indicative statement that draws the distinction between man-centered theology and God-centered theology. For by grace you have been saved. And with this, let us keep sola gratia fresh in our minds as we make our descent into the text we have before us and as we mine out this rich gospel truth. Now, I must say before we actually dive in that this is not an easy uh, particular section. We're going to start with with, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. Not an easy section to preach on because the natural natural mind will tend to gravitate towards, I'm not that bad. It wants to tend to say, but I'm not that bad. And so in order to show the beauty of sola gratia, Salvation by God's grace alone. We have to spend time on man's fallen state. So I need to ask you a few questions. Do you really realize the depths and the level of depravity of the human heart without the work of the Holy Spirit? Have you ever paused to wonder the awful state and condition you were in prior to your conversion? Have you ever taken time to thank God for rescuing you from bondage as you look at the potential downward spiral of sin that he could have left you in? One dear sister made a comment and said that God had to scrape the bottom of a trash can in order to get me. I say, amen, sister, me too. Paul summarizes our condition in Romans 3, 10 through 18. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside together. They have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues, they keep deceiving. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. And in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We need to start at a, at a critical starting point. 
when Adam fell, when Adam fell, we need to understand that we all fell with him. The entire human race has now is cast down into depravity, and everybody who has been born and breathes air is doomed. Man in his natural state not only shakes his fist at God, but secretly desires to be like God. It is because of this reason that man has a seed of sin reigning through him, and he is spiritually dead. And so when we look at what Paul says, he reminds them and says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Trespasses are the actions that we, when we purposely step over those things we know to be right. Man is in his fallen state is not only incapable of keeping God's standards, he's incapable of even keeping man's standards. Even from early childhood, man has filled his life with guilt-filled trespasses, offenses towards each other, offenses towards siblings, offenses towards parents, offenses towards a holy God. And not only is man filled with trespasses, but ultimately they have sinned and missed the mark of God's standard of perfection. Be ye perfect, for your heavenly Father in heaven is perfect. We don't understand. We're, we've been taught a different lesson in this world that says, no, the standard is not perfection. Man takes God's standards and rebels against him, both privately and openly. Everything from the little lies and hidden sins of the heart to the open sin-filled carnage we saw last week in Las Vegas. Every single person breathing today has missed the mark, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Paul writes and says, and you were dead in trespasses and sin. Spiritually, you were pronounced dead completely void of spiritual life, incapable of being resuscitated, incapable of pursuing after God, incapable of living a righteous life, incapable of walking in light, spiritually dead and without life. I want you to look back at some of the decisions that you have made in your life without God. Look back at the line of people that have been hurt. Look back when you had no interest in God Better yet, when you despise God. I have often shared with some of you that, that uh, I was raised in a Christian home and, and I went to church numerous times. My father was a, was a, a choir director, a music minister, and so uh, I was at church probably three, four times a week. Nevertheless, I heard my first sermon at 20. Why? Because I was dead. My ears had been stopped, stopped up with vanity, and my eyes were blinded to my own, with my own sinful pride. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly lived or walked. How? Paul says, according to the course or the age, the ion of this world. G. Campbell Morgan describes a list in 2 Timothy chapter 3 as the spirit of the age. He says, look at this. When, when Paul writes to Timothy, he says, look at this list. Lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. We live in a day and age described as a wicked and perverse generation. The unregenerate man regularly receives his view of life from media and inadvertently and unconsciously this informs his view of what's right and wrong, completely divorced from the Bible. And Paul says, and you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course, the direction, the trajectory of this world, 
and according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. The natural unregenerate man will conform to and align with the sinful tide of its culture. Let me say that again. The natural and unregenerate man will conform to and align with the sinful direction of its culture. And in case you haven't noticed, the course of this world is growing more and more hostile toward God. Paul writes to them, and you walked according to this world system. And many even of us have shook our fists at God, cursed God, beating our chest with pride. And even if we didn't say it through our mouths, we lived our lives as if to say, I want to live my life even if God is opposed to it. We walked according to the ruler of the authority of the air, the prince of the power of the air. When you walked, do you know that when you walked in accordance to the ruler of the authority of the air, you were at Satan's disposal to accomplish demonic agendas? When we look at the tragedies that have taken place last Sunday, the massive shooting and murder of 58 people, 500 injured in Las Vegas, when we look at the shooters of movie theaters, when we examine the shooters of high schools and college campuses, when we look at the rise of homosexuality and the inoculation of perverted agendas in our school systems, pockets of our country where racism is running rampant, when here the terrorist bombings and around the world and the killing of Christian converts from Islam. We can see what Paul means when he refers to the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Now, this may feel like, an ex this may feel like extremes, an extreme description, but if we are able to lay down our pride, we can see the trajectory of our former lives in the same company. If we're honest, church. And Paul would say, but among them, we too formerly lived. How? In the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, doing the things willed by the flesh. Whatever the flesh demanded, you gave it to it. And me too. Galatians 5, 19 through 21 says, now the deeds of the flesh are evident which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Whatever the flesh wanted, we fed it, consciously or unconsciously, without any spiritual restraint. But Paul would go a step further that makes sola gratia all the more lovely. He says, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Among them, we too also formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. What, is it, what does Paul mean when he says, even by nature? Because of the trespasses of our sins, mankind has incurred and is deserving of the wrath of God. This is not popular preaching. Paul says, by nature, the old nature is corrupt, dead in sin, slaves to its power, and in the opposition to God. By nature, meaning the passing down of Adam's offspring, the desire to pursue after unrighteousness and sin. That is the seed that has been placed in Adam when God said, Adam, you shall surely die. 
Adam didn't know what death was physically, yes. But spiritually, whoa. And Paul says, and by nature, children of wrath. Every person born on this earth has sinned, and according to the nature, they are objects deserving of God's righteous and eternal judgment. The wages of sin is death. The penalty of sin is death. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This truth is is a critical starting point. Before we answer the question, how then can man be saved? This is a critical starting point because if you start with man is incapable of having any type of goodness that he can add or merit to the process of salvation, then we have a starting point that says man is depraved, dead, not just sleep. God came and did a miracle. I know this is not popular preaching. You may never hear this in that mega church down in Houston, but I'm telling you the truth. That when Adam fell, sin entered the world, and the entire human race fell with him. And we have inherited a sinful nature that's deserving of God's eternal punishment. Now, this may come across as challenging because the world has believed the propaganda of Satan into believing that man is not in a serious condition as he really is. In fact, the world will tell you that man is actually good. And that is a lie from the pit, and it smells like smoke. But let God be true, and every man a liar. Paul is going to make a pivot in the text. But before we look at it, I must ask the question. If man, according to the scripture, is depraved, absent of spiritual life, dead in trespasses and sin, lives in the lust of their flesh, by nature children of wrath, living in opposition to God, alienated from God. Romans 5.10 says that we are even enemies of God. Is it possible that man in his fallen state is capable of producing anything of merit? Anything of worth? Any amount of good deeds that would be considered a contribution to the salvation of his, his eternal soul? The answer is an emphatic no. There is none who are righteous, not even one. Our righteousness amounts to nothing more than filthy rags. Now, this is what Mormons can't seem to get. This is what Muslims don't understand. What Jehovah's Witnesses don't want to believe. When I, when I ask, when, you know, this has been actually a quiet summer at the McMillan home. Uh, I think they've marked my house off. Uh, they don't... Am I telling the truth, Mrs. McMillan? They, they, have, they haven't come. Um, I think they marked my house. I don't know what that means, but um, they usually come quite often, and uh, they don't come anymore. And, and, and one of the things, when I get a chance to talk with them, um, I, I, I ask them a question. I hear ask them this question. So, so how, many, how many good works do you have to do in order for you to know that you made it into heaven? And every single time, there's a moment of silence and their brief humility, and they always say, I don't know. You may say, preacher, what you're saying just doesn't seem to be fair. Last Wednesday at the community group in Conifer, we talked about the fairness of God. On the contrary, What would be fair would be a holy God leaving all of mankind on a path of eternal destruction. That would be fair. What would be fair would be God who is a righteous judge and the creator of the whole universe. Taking everyone who shook their fist at him and cursed him and mocked him and not interrupt their parade straight into hell. That would be fair. What would be fair is if God had everyone who struggled with a dirty mouth, everyone who wrestled with pride, everyone who had immoral thoughts, everyone who criticized others, every thief, every lie teller, 
every racist, every committed an evil deed, and say to them, depart from me forever. That would be just and fair. That would be fair. That's where we need to start. And Paul would pivot in the text with two words, but God. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, but God. You were walking in accordance to the world, but God. You were a slave to sin, but God. You were deserving of God's wrath, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love by which he loved us. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved. Sola gratia. Colossians 1.13 says, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Colossians 2.12 and 13, Having been buried with him in baptism, in which you also raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead, when you were dead in your transgressions, and the uncircumcision of your flesh. Hebrews talks about how we had hearts of stone. He made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile towards us, and he taken it out of the way, having nailed it on the cross. For while we were still helpless, Romans says, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one would hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God. But God... For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Paul says in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, and he made him to become sin so that we might become the righteous of God through him. God's grace is abundantly rich. And then it would, it's almost as if it would not, if it was only as if God's grace would just spare us from wrath. If that was only it, but there's more. Paul says not only is his great love by which he loved us, but when we were in our transgressions of sin, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him. By his grace, this power gave you a new nature, gave you power over sin, united you with Christ, seated you in heavenly places, transformed you from a dead state into an adopted son and daughter, made you co-heirs with Christ, and secured your salvation for all eternity. The problem with Pelagianism is that if I could work for my salvation, then certainly enough, if I don't work hard enough, then I sure enough could lose it. And he's giving you this blessed hope. Even our dear brother Bill Long, when he closed his eyes on this side, opened them seeing the beauty of Jesus Christ and the inheritance of the saints. But we have to ask one final question. Why, Paul? Why? Why would God do such a thing? How could God love a sinner like me? A sinner like you? tells us, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, when we will no longer look dimly in the mirror, when our faith is revealed in its fullness, in the ages to come, when the already and not yet becomes already and right now. 
when we see him face to face and the glory of his majesty and reflect that this God-man bore our sins on a Roman cross and seated us in heavenly places, then we will see fully the richness of God's kindness and love in Christ Jesus. And as we are worshiping and basking the glory of the King of kings and the Lord of lords, we may ask one another the question which begins with, why are you here? And we would only be able to muster out the simple truth and re respond only by the grace of God. And Paul brings his doctrine to a crescendo that separates Christianity from all other world systems and religions. For by grace you have been saved. Through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Salvation by grace alone. Not as results of works, so that no one may boast. And you know we would, wouldn't you? We would boast, wouldn't we? When there is boasting, where there is boasting, there is deceit. Paul says in Romans and says, my boasting is excluded. In Galatians 6, Paul writes, but may it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And in closing, John Newton, in 1779, published one of the greatest hymns known to the church and the world, Amazing Grace. He writes, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believed. Through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. The Lord has promised good to me. His word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. Yea, when this flesh and heart shall fail and mortal life shall cease, I shall possess within the veil a life of joy and peace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow, the sun forbear to shine. But God who called me here below will be forever mine. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we have no days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Sola gratia, salvation is by God's grace alone. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. And even now, I pray that the words that were spoken would indeed convict the human heart. Not my words, but your words, Lord. Seeing the depraved state that you have plucked us out of, not because of our efforts or because we're special, but because you loved us before the foundation of the world, because of your grace. And we thank you for it. We pray that all these things would cause someone to ask the question, as the Philippian jailer did, what must I do to be saved? We present all these things to you. In the name of Jesus, who is Christ, the object of our grace. Amen.